Welcome back to another edition of Crash. Are you ready? This is your host, George Whitehurst Berry, and today we're very pleased to bring back a regular on our program, uh, Linda Runyon. She is a uh, a, a very uh, unique uh, lady, having lived off the land for literally for years, and uh, with the coming economic collapse this information could potentially literally save your life. We have a situation where I believe we're going to have food shortages, uh, and uh, in the crash sequence, which, as I've stated on the economics portion of my program numerous times, we have, I believe, a repetition of the 1920s to 1930s boom and bust cycle. Unfortunately, I suspect that the next major series of problems might be with the banks, and uh, they gave you no advance notice uh, when they would take your deposit on a Friday afternoon, uh, knowing they were going to close permanently on Monday morning. So, uh, again, I believe we will be, um, as this crash sequence progresses, uh, suffering major breakdowns in the food supply. So, again, uh, what Linda brings to the table, literally to the table, is a knowledge of how to survive anywhere, anytime, uh, with an abundance of densely nutritious, uh, on average seven to ten times more densely nutritious food than uh, the domesticated counterparts with uh, wild foods, you have the confidence of knowing you can make it through these difficult times to come. Linda, welcome back to the program. George, I'm so excited about today. Today is survival for kids and how to start right now teaching them survival, but teaching them in a fun, fun way. We're going to do everything from toothpaste to um uh, every kind of popsicle to uh, hair softener to uh, candy uh, with wild food in very simple ways this can be done. And you know what? The more I went over this to the show today and get everything ready, the more I thought, oh, gosh, this is another book. And I said I wouldn't write another one. <laughs> this is all material, George, found in my books and DVD and such, but taken out of context. Um, it really adds up to a... a a uh, great book for uh, parents with kids. So let's start right away with the rules for children because they're a little bit different than they are for us. It stops immediately after they get that plant in their hand. They have to bring it back and show it to an adult. And, of course, we know the adult foraging rules. We've gone over them many, many, many shows, and they're on everything. So with children, though, you teach them these rules. Don't put anything in your mouth. Absolutely not. Always check with your adult figure. And you never pick plants, flowers, seeds, or fruit near a roadside. You have to go in 100 feet. And um, then you teach them why, of course. This is all uh, teaching them. And never eat leaves or flowers without checking with an adult or put anything in your mouth. And these are the rules that you want to teach your child right off the bat. And overeating of any one kind of plant, because some of them are really yummy, can cause your body problems. Um, for instance, dandelion. You can, I mean, we tell kids they can eat all they want. They generally don't go more than 10 or 15 at the very most. But even if they ate a half a cup, it's not going to hurt them. Uh, dandelions are so high in calcium. And do you teach the child to pick the, the blossom and twist it and pull the stem away? And what they have is a very uh, fluffy yellow um, petals in their hand, and they can literally eat all they want. Um, they're eating something that's sugar-free, and yet it breaks down in your body as sugar would and um, is uh, safe for a uh, – uh, we, we have found that they're quite safe in quantity – uh, flowers with children that might have problems. So here we go. Um, number one plant after the rules are instilled with children. Um, I feel that we should start with things they're more familiar with. Have them sit down and figure out how much money, if they're old enough now, have them, how much money you spend a month, let's say. 
let's say you spend a month for desserts and candy for them, X amount of dollars. And and just make it quite bluntly, you know, we spent fifteen twenty five dollars this month on these things. Well, um, let's change it. Let's look out in the backyard and see what we might have. So the first thing you might find, let's say, is a rose. And a rose is everything uh, in survival to a child. Um, kids really love to do this. They pick a rose. And when they're told that they can literally eat petal by petal the entire thing, all roses are edible. Now, you're talking different colors and miniature roses also. And we make candy at them with kids. And what they learn to do is to pull the petals off. That in itself is a great experience. Just put them on a nice white paper plate, all the petals. And then mother has a frying pan. Mother, and if the child is old enough, of course, they can do this. Mother has a frying pan, a little bit of olive oil. And when you put the petals in there, they make a bubble. It's, it's really neat. They, they pop up into a bubble, a bubble, just sort of like popcorn out of a, a kernel. And when it makes its bubble, very carefully slide underneath it and put it out on a paper towel. When you do this, sprinkle some confectionery sugar on it. The child loves to do this. And what you have are these little bubbles and or petal, petals, if it collapses on you, um, of candy. And they're delicious. They're really wonderful. We have served to uh, luncheons and dinners just hundreds of these bubbles. This is something a child loves to do no matter what color the rose is. And they'll be literally lining up to, uh, to make rose petal candy. And that's one way to save some money. Another way might be to pick uh, a flower that you know is edible, and in our material we tell you everything from pansies to violets. And if you pick those little Johnny Jump Ups, the kids go in the grass out here and pick hundreds of those little faces or violet faces, all you need to do is whip them into vanilla ice cream. And the kids love to do this, have a little paper plate, they pick them, and then that paper plate, they they uh, put the blossoms in some semi-melted um, vanilla ice cream, whip it in, and then refreeze it. And the kids just love to serve that to their friends. That's that's a great night out for older teenagers even to make their own ice cream out of edible flowers like that. And it saves you a lot of money. All right. We'll be back after the break with Linda. All right, we're back with Linda Runyon. Uh, Linda, uh, we were talking about uh, the um, excellent uh, hints that you have for uh, kids. Uh, wh what um, What is the first thing that one should tell uh, one's children when looking for wild foods? And uh, that's just go over this because we've got so many new listeners. Um, we've gone oh, okay. over it before, but again, the um, we are the fastest growing program on the network, so let's uh, caution the new listeners about the protocol for the first thing one would tell one's children in I identifying. I think the, uh, the most important one, George, would be do not put any plant in your mouth uh, until you check with an adult. Um I work with kids all the time, and uh, when you have a group of like 60, 70, 80, I get a chance to see what kids do on their own, and some of them automatically put things in their mouth. If you say you can, you can, uh, let's say, eat pine needle, the first thing they do is put it in their mouth. Um, it's according to the grade level and how much their parents have taught them, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'm going to be quite blunt about this. So if you're going to teach a child to eat wild food, you need to pick a couple of these fun things that we're talking about today, just a couple fun things, and keep instilling over and over and over these rules. Walk 100 feet from a car path. This is important because they need to, they need to know this. They need to know about a car going by and how everything comes out of that exhaust and comes down at 30, 40, 50 feet according to the speed the car is going. Some kids love to know those details. So um, with unleaded gas, it's much better, but we're sticking by our rules 
a hundred feet off the car path would be the best way to teach a child. And and with little ones, we literally walk them. We'll, we'll walk a three, four year old that length, okay, and show them how far, and then they can start looking for the plant that we're looking for. Now, if it's in their backyard, of course, you use your head, you know, and you figure how many, you know, feet from a highway you are, so you're okay there. But you teach them that and teach them as the first rule, do not put any plant in your mouth until you check with an adult. And then I always teach the kids to bring a sample of the plant back with them to the house or wherever and ask that adult. Because how the adult doesn't know unless they have that sample. And if they don't know themselves, well, that's why we're all out there. We're all wild food teachers and we all have books and DVDs and things like that. And they're aimed at you being able to safely teach your children these things. And um, we even have a free newsletter that you want to be sure to sign up for if you go on our website. And the kids can read it. It's on a third grade level. Kids can read them easily. And it, it will give them these facts. And if you go on the website, of ofthefield.com, be sure and sign up for the free newsletter. We don't want your full name, just your first name and your email, and it will automatically come to you. It's an automatic thing every month. And let your kids have this. And uh, if they read, they'll be able to, to read these rules over and over. And then I, I can go on a long time, George, by saying bring the plant home once it's identified, teach them to wash it under running water. And remember that eating wild plants is the same as any other food except that it's more nutritious. It's better for you. So if you, let's say, ate a quart of pansies all of a sudden or a quart of violets all of a sudden, you would feel quite full because the amount of energy from that um, is double, triple, even, even as you said, uh, six, seven times more than regular food. So uh, this is something that older kids can understand, and they understand they eat less. If you go to a maple tree, for instance, maple trees every every child knows, and they all of us know that little pinwheel that comes down, that uh, the seed of the maple tree. I don't care what kind it is. Well, the Chippewas have established up in the Great Lakes uh, in Minnesota area a pharmacopoeia of what to do with wild plants, and I love I love to study that, and that's pretty well um, covered in my books, and. Um, I teach kids to take their scissors, their little uh, cutting scissors that they have, you know, safety scissors if they're young, and if they're older, of course, regular scissors, and cut the meaty portion of those helicopters and leave the wing section. And kids just love to do this. That meaty portion is food, and it can be eaten, and the Chippewas take, take all of that meaty portion, and the children pound it with a rock. And if you uh, teach a child to to take a heavy implement, for instance, and literally um, squash it, uh, it's it's a lot of fun to fry it. And it has a twinge of maple syrup taste. It's just a twinge of it. Um, Your leaves have a twinge. Um, There's nothing like the sap, of course, the maple syrup that we make. But um, that's a whole educational experience right there for a child to take their scissors and cut that off. And... um, that's that that's that's a definite thing if they've learned don't put it in your mouth, bring it home, bring a sample home, and then research that sample the mother father and um uh, it's it's really neat because you'll come up with uh, a whole, a whole lot of ideas to do with various different things but let's take let's take for instance um toothpaste. You add up what your family, according to how many kids, might spend on toothpaste. It's kind of expensive. And um, there's lots out there that e- that really equal pretty much what you would use uh, in regular toothpaste. Strawberries, little baby strawberries, the little tiny wild strawberries. D- George, they remove tartar off your teeth as well as toothpaste. We didn't use anything on toothpaste uh, for 13 years or more. Um, we used strawberries, wild strawberries, and in the winter time, I had it as jam, which was really cool because you just take some jam, you scrub your teeth with it, and that wild strawberry has some something in it there, which is known to remove tartar, as well as toothpaste removes tartar. So um, 
that's a fun thing to teach them to use strawberries, little baby strawberries, and pick some, bring them in, and scrub your teeth with it. And these are things I'm, I'm going to talk about today that are that are relatively relatively safe for kids. They're not, you know, they're going to zero in on the flowers or the strawberries or things like this in their backyard. Um, when we go on with a pine tree, um, pine Certainly. tree. Yeah, because there's so much on a pine tree. We've covered pine trees a lot, but for children, since we're doing kids stuff today, um, the sap that comes out in the spring is probably the best glue you'll ever have. Um, we glue wounds with that sap. We carry that sap in our survival pack. We put them in little glass containers. I have a glass container in my medicine chest. Um, besides sap being so high in calories, you, you teach the child that that tree right there, let's see, there's enough sap in that tree for the whole town that you live in. There's enough calories in that tree for the whole town that you live in as food. Well, that uh, pine tree is uh, certainly uh, an incredible resource, uh, and we'll wow. uh, continue this after the break. All right, we're back with Linda Runyon. Linda, uh, the pine tree is such an incredible resource, and I would imagine uh, a favorite to start teaching kids with because it uh, is easy to identify and there's so many uses for it. Um, what, uh, what would you say to someone who um, was teaching survival skills to the children uh, what's the first thing, the second thing, the third thing they should uh, teach the uh, child about what to do with that incredible resource, the pine tree? Ah, okay. First thing, all pines are edible. Um, they'll ask, you know, is theirs in their yard with jack pine or long needle or whatever. That's the first thing that I find they want to know. And the second thing they want to know is, you know, can you eat? The outside bark, and I tell them no. Um, I go into great detail of how to use twigs because twigs are easily scrubbable, first of all, with a toothbrush under running water, just like you would a potato. And the small twigs, to me, are the popsicle sticks. The small twigs, to me, are eating bark if you want to do that. Um, it is a taste that's just the same uh, all parts of a pine tree are, to me, the same, but the bark is a bit stronger. Uh, you're talking, you're talking very thin, you know, the very thin twigs that the, that the actual needles grow on. So you tell them to pick, pick a, a few twigs with the needles on it. That's that's the second thing that we we show them of how they can get a, a lot of needles that way. But they also have bark to be able to clean those twigs and chew on it. Uh, my little son used to eat it just like it was, um, you know, a, a granola bar. Um, seriously, we stood around a pine tree and would take the needles and we would twist them in our hands, a bunch of them. And I show kids how to do that right away because I don't want them putting them in their mouth. Um, they could, you know, get hurt doing that. So I tell them, don't don't stick the needles in your mouth. Take them and twist them. Children are extremely bright, and it's just amazing. All they have to do is see it once, and they know how to do it. So uh, you show them how to take a bunch, you twist them, and you chew from the center of that twist. Um, that, that twist, to me, represents safety net there because they're chewing the sap from the center and getting the taste of the forest. And you get the reaction right away. Oh, that's not bad. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's okay. Um, it smells like my Christmas tree. Uh, you know, lots of different remarks. Then from there on, I teach them to take the needles off the twigs. And you can do so much with them. If you just put them in a pot, um, mother can simmer them and uh, cool that down. And it is either iced tea, pine tea, or it's ice cubes made out of pine tea or it is popsicles made out of pine tea. And you can go a step further and make jello. 
um, Jello is something that you can buy the uh, teach the children when they shop with mother to get the unflavored um, gelatin. There's gelatin that's just completely unflavored, and that's what we used. And we use that uh, to make all sorts of jams and jellies, too, um, to make them, uh, you know, stiff in the way that we wanted them. And and you just follow the directions. It will, it will tell you so much of water. Well, instead of water, you use the pine tea. Use the pine tea in any strength you want. And you can you can show them immediately how they can uh, make everything from tea to ice cubes to popsicles to jello. And they come up with all sorts of ideas to use the pine tree. The last group I last group I, I taught came up with more ideas than I, you can imagine. They were peeling the bark back very carefully, George, and making braids out of bark. And then one child was literally making a basket out of those little skinny braids. And the other other one child said, "Can I use these as a shoelaces?" And um, I said, "No, the cactus." It was better for that, really, because what you have out there where you live is far better. The yucca is far stronger. Um, pine bark will um, dry and be crispy. So we carry it in our pockets, and it's very chewable. It's, it's like you're eating an orange and vitamin C, and you're getting calories. So you're getting en- energy from it. So uh, we teach them it's a very nutritious, um, energy-producing tree that can produce a lot of different food for them, and it can also feed a whole city, and they love to get that idea. And uh, that uh, uh, goes to the sap, but the sap for me is something that they need to really experience, even in the middle of winter. You can pick. Um, we, we've been known back in the woods at 20 below, seriously, to if we see sap that has crystallized on the side of a tree, and um, crystallize and frozen quickly type thing, which it does. There's a tree over here right now. We're not freezing yet, but the sap is already crystallized on the sides. So it stays clean. And you can literally wash it under the faucet. It's, it's like a like a pebble of, of dried sap crystallized all the way through. We teach them that that's food. And we teach them that that is uh, a lot of calories, um, and can put survival wise um, can really quench your. It's like a little candy to them, and um, the kids love that idea, and they can use it uh-huh. when it's running as as glue, and they love that idea too. Of course, they do put too much on them on their bug bites and stuff, and they they turn <laughs> they turn it turns black on your skin. So um, we always have fun with that because they, they dab it all over their mosquito bites and bug bites. You know, these are campy kids that I teach. And, of course, they all look like they have all these black dots all over them. It's kind of fun. <laughs> huh. So, you, you know, you you don't warn them about that. Just let them learn that. That's kind of fun. And um, But that pine tree is everything uh, to you. And if you wanted to take the pine tree, you know, all the way in its context with a child, according to the age that they're at and everything, um, the ropes that the uh, pioneers used were from pine, but they are not the outside tree. The the roots that grow can grow 50 feet long. And um, they found that if they followed some of these tap roots, these pine tap roots out of uh, big ponderosa pine and stuff, they got they got some strip bark, this is all well documented, that could be braided into extremely thick rope and, uh, of course, didn't dry crispy uh-huh. like the twigs do. Yeah. And, um, well, let's see. What else can we teach? The kids came up with well, different... Well, now, what, 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 um, um, how do you teach them to use the catkins? Ah, oh, thank you, George. Thank you. My goodness. Um, the catkins are just in the spring. In the spring, the the new needles are growing, and it begins the pine tree with having these little. They look like almost baby pine cones, and they call them catkins. And um, they're so high in calories that we would we would go out as a family and collect a quart of them, if, and that was easily done off of one tree. And five, six of those would be like an orange. Um, there, I don't have my nutrition chart in front of me, but it's in our field guide. Our field guide has all the nutrition on all the wild plants in the center, and you'll be able to figure out for your child, black and white, what it equals in their everyday 
diet. So the catkins themselves are very high in calories. And we love that um, idea of teaching them how much calories is in those little tiny things. So they, they get the picture, boy. They, they, they'll collect those things really fast. And um, they can get, as I say, a quart of them without a problem. And you put them in a, in a shirt box, whatever, they dry in your house. And when they're completely bone dry, uh, we teach kids just to uh, have your mother put the oven up to 200, turn it off. This is something you must do with your mother, of course. And uh, you have them on a cookie sheet just to 200 and turn it off. And then you bottle. And they'll stay forever in there. We have bottles. Okay, we'll be, yep. we'll be back after the break with uh, Linda Runyon. All right, we're back with Linda Runyon. Uh, Linda, you have... Um, uh, you have these children who um, are just beginning to be taught the ways of survival with wild foods, and we've talked about how uh, the, you prioritize that. Uh, would the pine tree be the first, uh, first resource that you would direct children to? Absolutely. Um, or, okay. I, I, I hate to interrupt you. It, to me, it gives the most... Uh, Kids seem to immediately have terrific hope when they see the size of the thing and, yes, it would feed the whole, and how would you do that? And it it's different than a little flower in your hand. It's, it's Picture yourself as a child, and all you hear on the news is negative. That's all you hear. And maybe we won't have enough food and maybe whatever. All of this is going in, and survival is survival, mental and physical. It's a state of mind as well you as, got it. as, well as it's knowledge. It's horrible what kids are going through now. I mean, they do stand in a grocery store and think, oh, well, how could this really be if they thought about it? But, uh, you know, they answer that real quick, too. Um, well, I, uh, to, me, to me, now, of course, uh, Yule Gibbons, the classic author, uh, called the uh, cattail the supermarket of the swamps. Right. But, uh, so that's in a my mind, well, it's a danger. Water, water, danger. I mean, it, 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 yeah, it, and it is. It, it is. A, it is a supermarket of the swamps. But to me, uh, the virtually ubiquitous real supermarket is the pine tree. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. You can look out your window. You'll find one somewhere in your neighborhood. No matter. I mean, this is like back east it's just a joke how many there are of them therefore the child sees that immediately in his mind's eye so they want to know everything about that pine tree we have a little flyer which i send out with orders and um um also it's in our newsletter and it's uh um uh, in part well again let's let's give your website uh, again for the new listeners uh, of the field dot com. Uh, for those of you who are new listeners, Linda is a regular on our program. Uh, check out her website at of the field dot com. There are survival books on wild foods, also cards, which should be in everybody's backpack and vehicle, in my opinion, and uh, a new DVD. And so. Uh, you have the best, in my opinion, resource on wild food. Oh, thank uh, but you. Linda's also a firm believer that uh, you should uh, get at least three different sources to identify plants. So you can find mm -hmm. very useful links there on yep. uh, Linda's website to uh, Dr. Duke and uh, Wild Man Steve Brill, for example, uh, which will give you um, supporting uh, documentation on just exactly what you're looking for. And, you know, even if you're a mother that likes to cook gourmet style and put on dinner parties and things, have your kids help you with, like, an edible centerpiece or or all, all of this to teach you survival. As you go along, just having them be in the backyard picking a dandelion for a purpose. A dandelions would be second, George, because dandelions, generally kids just know everywhere. They, they, see, them, they see them everywhere, and um, it, it gives them a real good feeling. That it doesn't have any taste to it. If you twist and pull that fluff away, it does not have any bitterness or herbal taste. I love it myself. We stir fry them every night all summer. And uh, but the thing is, for a child, it's an immediate secure thing. 
to know at roses, for instance, that they might have a lot of access. Well, children, to. I mean, they always they gravitate towards dandelions anyway because they they want to uh, they want to pluck the uh, uh, the ball of of uh, seeds aerial uh -huh. aerial the bound ball. seeds and blow <laughs> blow them <laughs> into the air. So uh, well, we they take to it. they take to Sorry. dandelions. Uh, 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 but when in my, in my coloring book, I didn't mention the coloring book. We do have um, all these rules and everything, but we only have plants. I'm looking: violets, dandelions, strawberry, clover. Well, let's now. We just uh, we're in the final segment here, so oh. um, we we kind of uh, we kind of talked about the anatomy of the pine tree for children. Uh, what what are the um, what are the priorities of teaching kids about the dandelion? The, the priorities um, would be that there's a look-alike. There's a look-alike plant on, on the land that's called um, cat, uh, cat, um Oh, dear, I forgot the name of it. Isn't that awful? It's, it's, to me, it's not a wild food in any way. And it looks like a dandelion, but it's much, much smaller. It's only about a quarter inch, but it's yellow. And that's, that, that is the thing that immediately I could go out any place, USA, up here, back east here, and show them the difference. Because anywhere you have dandelions, you have this little look-alike thing. Um, it doesn't have spiky leaves like a dandelion. It has rounded leaves. They're more rounded. Um, at first I thought it was male-female dandelion back when I was really going to figure out all the details of everything. And, uh, but it isn't. It's a, it's, a, it's a plant that is not a food. It's not toxic, but it's not a food. So now what do we, what do we look for? Uh, obviously, dandelions are very easy to identify, but what yeah, do we look the for? Show them the difference in, between in the, the leaf and show them the difference the between the well, flower. Sorry. Okay, so in, in the dandelion, what do we look for that's not in the lookalike? Um, the spiky leaves, the leaves that are um, like um, okay. And this is this dandelion. again. This is this is uh, dandelion is uh, from the French uh, uh, dent de lion. Dent mm -hmm. is uh, is the root word for dentist, dentiste. Mm -hmm. So uh, dent uh, literally tooth of the lion, dent de lion. So mm -hmm. uh, that That's is that is yeah. good, it. It does look like a lion's teeth. Uh, uh, that, uh, and, and, the leaf it, and it goes to flow, resembles. so you'll see all those different stages on a lawn. Whereas this other plant doesn't; it stays yellow until it dry, you know, browns out and goes away. So um, it's it's simple. They do see it; they see it almost instantly. So uh, um, I also show them that dandelion has milk in it, and kids kids are awestruck by this. Dandelion's a wild lettuce, and I teach them that all wild lettuces have this milk. And that's a mm -hmm. that's a whole show, just wild lettuce, seriously. And uh, if you pick any part of the dandelion, the stem, for instance, it's uh, milky. It has a drop of milk coming out. That is uh, only dandelion will do that. The um, plant that looks like it will not. And um, I like to teach them that once they get used to the taste of the dandelion, which most kids in all countries eat them in salads except us, um, we need to start eating that because it's so high in calcium. That's something that our kids need really badly, and they don't have to drink quarts and quarts of milk to get it. It, it really is in your wild plants, and it's it's in a, an extremely um, good way for your body just to gobble it up. And w we have to make gum out of the stems. And um, we actually they were using, and uh, they had uh, such a shortage of um, of uh, natural rubber. Uh, latex in World War II, they were using uh, dandelion latex. Uh, you know, they could have been much develop. Yeah, yeah, they should have used milkweed. Milkweed is solid. Uh, you know, <laughs> they'd have gotten a big. Excuse me. <laughs> well, we have a, we have another super we have another superfood uh, with the dandelion, just like the, the pine tree, um, and which the. Uh, uh, the whole plant is useful. I mean, the roots, the leaves, you name it, and it's the red clover. It's, well, of the dandelion, the whole, uh, we won't have time to cover anything else uh, in this uh, in this session, but uh, Linda will be back with us. Uh, she's uh, bringing a whole series of um, 
of interesting and uh, innovative form uh, 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 formats about wild foods. So we'll take up those other plants uh, next time. But now okay. with the dandelion, we can we can roast the, we can we can make uh, uh, we can make a coffee substitute. What else, Linda? Um, oh, I French fry the flour. I teach them how to make these little balls. It's fantastic. You can French fry them. Um, these are older kids, of course. Um, the root can be scrubbed with a toothbrush, and you can eat it raw. And we also take a uh, potato peeler and we peel shreds of the root and put it in salad. And we teach them that it's worldwide, that all the other countries, Egypt and everywhere, revere this plant. And again, uh, the leaves are a fantastic salad ingredient. Um, thank you so much, Linda. Uh, uh, this hour you, has passed too quickly, but uh, we'll, we will be back with Linda uh, uh, next week.